honor the memory of those who served their country and visit the upcoming exhibit, 100 Years of World War I, by Tyler Briley. This show marks the 100th anniversary of Armistice. The opening reception will begin Saturday, October 27, 2018, at 2 p.m., and the show will remain on exhibit from October 27th to November 23rd, 2018, in the Kent Farndale Gallery in the Scugog Memorial Public Library at 231 Water Street in Port Perry. Tyler Briley is a local sculptor and painter, and the only living Canadian artist with works in the War Museum and Parliament's Centre Block. I've always tried to promote our Canadian identity and those responsible for it, said Briley, who believes the true value of public art is the bridge created between the past and the future. The Kent Farndale Gallery is open seven days a week during library hours. Please call 905-985-7686 for more information. Celebrating Modern Agriculture Cam Dahl, President of Cereals Canada Most farmers are reluctant to talk about modern agriculture. Our own industry advertisements promote the image of a farm with a faded red barn and a few chickens running about in a pastoral setting. That is not modern agriculture, and we need to stop letting agriculture be portrayed this way. It is not hard to understand why modern agriculture shies away from talking about what we do on the farm. Modern agriculture practices are regularly attacked by activists who want to return to the lost golden age of Old MacDonald's farm. One just has to look at the recent flurry of negative media coverage of glyphosate, one of the most studied and reviewed pesticides in history, to see evidence of agriculture practices being questioned. The truth is, Old MacDonald retired a long time ago. We should let him enjoy his dotage. His day was characterized by rural poverty, houses with no running water, and no central heat. Rural schooling was in one room that gave those in them little chance of advanced education. The good old days were not very good for those living in them. Modern agriculture has changed that. Today, most agriculture production in Canada takes place on commercial farms that are thriving businesses. Mostly owned and operated by families, they are managed by individuals with advanced degrees and a deep understanding of international markets. The equipment is not rusting pickups and open cab tractors, but combines, sprayers, and tractors guided by satellites. Seeds, fertilizers, and pesticides used are the result of years of intensive research. These tools are designed to have a minimal environmental footprint and to be safe for farmers and consumers alike. I am told by professional communicators that talking about modern agriculture in this way does not effectively reach consumers and give them comfort in how their food is produced. Someone in a downtown urban center shopping for their kids' lunch does not care that much about eradicating rural poverty. They just want to know they will be giving their kids a safe and nutritious lunch. So what has modern agriculture done for consumers? Let's tackle affordable. By February 9th of 2018, the average Canadian household earned enough income to pay for their grocery bill for the entire year, spending about 10% of their income on food. Want to compare? Portuguese consumers spend about 17% of their income on food, Russians about 28%, and Nigerians 56%. Those of us involved in agriculture need to do a better job of communicating how modern farming tools and practices have given Canadians access to some of the cheapest and highest quality food in the world. We also need to be able to relate what happens when ill-conceived regulations take those tools away. Modern Canadian agriculture is also delivering some of the safest food in the world. A recent study by the Conference Board of Canada ranked the food safety performance of Canada and 16 other developed OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, nations. Canada's food safety ranked the highest of all the countries examined. Modern Canadian agriculture has a very good environmental story to tell. Modern practices such as conservation tillage are increasing the health of soils, reducing the amount of fuel used, and reducing soil erosion. Precision agriculture, which uses satellites to precisely steer equipment, is maximizing the efficiency of pesticides and fertilizers, further reducing fuel use and protecting water from nutrient runoff. In the last 40 years, energy use per tonne of wheat produced has reduced by 39%. 40 years ago, soil organic matter was being depleted with every crop. Modern agriculture has changed this picture dramatically, 
and today organic matter in prairie soils is increasing every year. This means the soil is healthier, it is more productive, less susceptible to soil erosion, and farms across Canada are sequestering carbon dioxide. Why are these good news stories about modern agriculture not getting through to average Canadians? One of the reasons is those who are opposed to modern agriculture are focused on their communication efforts and have spent the time and money to coordinate their work. Agriculture, on the other hand, does not have united communication efforts. We are all focused on our individual companies and organizations, and often communicating with the public is left to side-of-the-desk projects. This needs to change. Agriculture needs to give time, money, and coordination to our outreach. Modern agriculture has a good story to tell, but if we aren't telling it, then we are letting others speak for us, and all consumers will hear are concerns from outside our industry. National Organization gives almost $100,000 in Lindsay. Kawartha Lakes Food Source, KLFS, was granted $97,000 to fight poverty in the city of Kawartha Lakes. We were one of three organizations nominated in Ontario and are honoured to be chosen to represent our province, said Heather Kirby, General Manager. Ms. Kirby added, We demonstrated our ability to find new and creative ways to get food to people. We are in a position to create lasting change in our community. We are tremendously grateful to the Enterprise Holdings Foundation and Food Banks Canada for supporting KLFS in creating new and innovative programs that will allow us to better meet the changing needs of our community, stated KLFS Board Chair Dennis Geelan. This funding will be used for feasibility to determine the needs of our community and how KLFS can best meet those needs, a partnership program with local restaurants and caterers to package viable food at the end of service into individual freezer meals for clients, especially beneficial for those with limited cooking facilities, for example, limited to a microwave and for singles who may have difficulty cooking nutritious meals for one, as well as the opening of two new food banks in the city of Kawartha Lakes. Community consultations have taken place to discuss the pilot of a shopping-style food bank in Lindsay at the KLFS Distribution Centre. The plan will also include a food bank in Kinmount to serve the needs of residents in the northern city of Kawartha Lakes communities. Leah Anderson, the new Capacity Boost Coordinator at KLFS, is excited to offer client choice through the shopping style model, which will allow clients to pick their own items. As a member of the Ontario Association of Food Banks, we will lead by example best food bank practices province-wide. This includes implementing client care standards, a shopping style food bank, and adapting to meet clients' changing needs. Traditionally, the role of the food bank was to bridge a gap in life events, such as a job loss or economic emergencies. However, Food insecurity and not having enough is a reality for many Canadians in 2018, due to a variety of economic and social issues. This grant will increase what KLFS can do within our community by increasing food security and access to healthy food. KLFS can work to alleviate poverty in our community by empowering and educating clients to stretch their food when needed. Technical foul. North Durham Sports. Mojax fall to Chiefs in overtime. Dan Kearns, The Standard, Scugog. The Port Perry Mojax had a tough week as they lost to the Clarington Eagles and the Lakefield Chiefs. The Mojax faced the Eagles at the Garnet B Record Complex on Thursday, October 18th. Under three minutes into the first period, Cody Frunner scored to give Port Perry their first lead of the game. However, late in the period, the Eagles struck twice and had a 2-1 lead after the first 20 minutes of play. Clarington scored twice more before two minutes had passed in the second period, stretching their lead to 4-1. Simon Figg scored over 12 and a half minutes into the second frame, cutting the lead to 4-2. But that would be as far as the Mojacks would get, as there were no goals scored in the third period. The Mojacks looked for some redemption on home ice when they faced the Lakefield Chiefs, on Sunday, October 21st, at Scugog Arena. Both teams battled hard to start the first period, and the Mojacks got on the board first. With less than eight minutes left in the first frame, Spencer Robinson put the puck in the net, giving Port Perry the first lead of the game. However, Lakefield scored two power play goals early in the second period and took their first lead 2-1. 
But almost two minutes after Lakefield's second goal, the Mojacks tied the game. Froner backhanded the puck over Chiefs goaltender Andrew Barwinski's shoulder. Then, late in the period, Robinson scored his second goal of the game after connecting on a pass in front of the Lakefield net from Derek Risebro, and Port Perry led 3-2 after 40 minutes of play. However, Lakefield again tied the game, just over five and a half minutes into the third period. Both teams battled hard in the third, but neither team could retake the lead, so the game headed to overtime. A minute and 19 seconds into overtime, the Chiefs scored the winner, taking the game 4-3. Despite the loss, Mojack's head coach, Tom Boyle, said he liked the way the team played. I thought it was a typical Port Perry Lakefield kind of hockey game. Both teams worked hard, played hard, finished their hits, battled in the corners, and battled net front, he said. One-timers. The Mojacks have just one game on their schedule this weekend, a matchup against Clarington at Scugog Arena on Sunday, October 28th at 2.25 p.m. The Standard Podcast was produced by Greenstream Studio for the Standard Newspaper. 